The following program is rated M for a mature audience. It contains adult themes and coarse language. This program contains scenes that may concern some viewers. Welcome to Hungry Beast. Tonight, our special subject is waste. From the lucrative business of celebrity trash picking to poo-powered prisons and crime scene cleaning tips. But first... Last week, we ran a story about Asian Australians having surgery to make their eyes look whiter. Now we've heard of a new trend taking off in America, elven ears. The cosmetic procedure involves cutting the cartilage at the top of the ear and then sewing it into a point. And from the waste depot, Australians throw out two million computers a year. Our e-waste stays on shore, but lots of other countries send theirs to China. And more specifically, places like Guaya, home to five and a half thousand businesses that dismantle more than 680,000 kilograms of e-junk by hand every year, a fraction of the mountains that surround them. There are dirty jobs and there are dirtier jobs. And then there are those we can hardly imagine. Hungry Beast's Ali Russell spent some time with a cleaner who goes to work in a biohazard suit. And a warning, some scenes in this report might distress you. I think there's two things that make me vomit, and that's egg and or faeces, an excessive amount of faeces. My days, generally, I don't know where I'm going to be in the next half hour. No two jobs are ever the same. We had one man and he hadn't put out his rubbish for roughly 18 years. We had one a couple of years ago and he'd roughly been dead on his lounge chair in the lounge room for a month. My name is Gabrielle Simpson. I have a very specialised cleaning company where we do forensic cleaning. So crime scenes, unattended deaths, squalor, anything unusual. This is an example of a pillow. It's infected with blood. We don't have smell of vision, but to me, it's also the smell of decomposition. In this job, a woman has had liver failure and they vomit up very thick, black, gritty blood. It didn't happen very quickly. She sort of stumbled to the bathroom. She's lost a lot of blood. She's been into the kitchen. She sat on the lounge. She's touched the doors, the light switches. And she actually collapsed between the drawers at the side of the bed. We very meticulously have to disinfect and check everything for blood. Summertime, we're very, very busy with unattended deaths. We had a clean where a man had passed away in his bedroom upstairs on his single bed and within a space of five or six days his body fluids had seeped from the upstairs bedroom right through to the lounge room below. So, you know, we end up removing the floor in the bedroom and the ceiling to the lounge room. blood. A sort of term used is that it's coffee blood. It's very dark. It's, it's sort of like it's black. That's why they refer to it as coffee blood. I've been doing this work for nearly 11 years. I started out just doing general office cleaning and domestic cleaning and I was approached to check stolen cars for syringes and it just escalated from there get a lot of failed suicides. Um, they're not particularly the nicest of claims to do generally. We had one recently. I went in and I actually came out white because he had lost so much blood. 
one of my girls refused to come in because the amount of blood. She waited until I got all the floor clean before she'd come in and help. You get to finish one of these cleans and you are absolutely exhausted. It emotionally, it does affect you. As a cleaner, the work that we do is very invasive. You, you're sort of seeing people's last movements and what they've done. It does affect us, but, you know, it's part of our job. But I love the work that I do. I wish I started doing this when I was 21. It's very gratifying in helping people. To do this type of work, you've got to be a fairly strong sort of person, uh, physically, mentally. Yes, you have to have a strong stomach. Um, it's, you've also got to be non-judgmental. I think that's the biggest thing. Don't judge people. It's just so intriguing doing this work seeing how other people live. It's very gratifying what we do. Basically what I do is I put everything back together. Stuff said, waste. You go through garbage like a pig. You're a pig mentality. Bob Dylan in a secretly recorded phone conversation with AJ Weberman, an obsessed fan who went through Dylan's bins in 1971. It was coming over the park and as it approached us, it got bigger. All the colours that you see that come from fire, all those colours were there. Tulsa resident Lottie Williams, after being struck by a piece of falling space junk in 1997, a once in a trillion event. The rubbish and bodies make you stop and think, this is one hell of a dangerous place to be. Colonel Michael Kefford on the estimated 50 tonnes of refuse and 100 frozen corpses on Mount Everest. Kefford led an unsuccessful summit attempt in 1992. Messy. Cluttered. Wasting precious space. You need Stephen Hawking's quantum space bag. Put down that vacuum and let the vacuum of a space-time singularity store all your favourite blankets, towels and jumpers in infinite parallel universes. The crushing weight of antimatter keeps everything wrinkle-free. Add new dimensions to your closet with Stephen Hawking's quantum space bags. Available in small, medium and infinitely expanding. It's a mark of how obsessed we are with celebrity when increasingly we care not just about who they are and what they do, but what they leave in their bins. One person's trash is another person's treasure. Especially if the first person is George Clooney and the other person doesn't mind getting a bit dirty. Welcome to the sordid, lucrative world of celebrity trash pickers. The people who go through the wheelie bins of celebrities. And the faint hope of finding a coffee cup or a lipstick tube that fans will want to dish out some cash for. Like Britney Spears chewing gum which went for 14000 on eBay. Or a lock of Justin Bieber's hair went for 40668 US dollars. Meaning? Finally, we have a foolproof method to truly measure celebrity. By how much their trash sells for. So we travelled the country to find out whose trash will reign supreme. And where does celebrity start its day? At sunrise. Well, David's just up in the corner. Looking really normal. Look normal. Just here to clean the bins. Coming, guys. Right, what have we found in Koshi's bin? A bloody... Calculator. Then Mon hit up the ARIA award winning hottest 100 topping Julia Stone's place. This is something. While Mark had lunch with comedian Josh Thomas. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mon risked her life by playing in the trash of independent MP Bob Catter. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, Bullet shells, possibly used on greenies. We're gonna make a mint. And Mark found Ruby Rose. I think it's like a dog bed. Some dog toys. It's time to auction them online and find out just how big these celebrities really are. 
Fast forward one nail-biting week of hitting refresh and... Coming in at number five, we have Koshi's Calculator, $46. Number four, Josh Thomas with his half-eaten burrito and cardigan, we have $100. <laughs> number three, Bob Catter with his empty bullet cartridges for $200. Number two, Julia Stone with a napkin coming in at $248.45. So the winner, earning them the title of Australia's trashiest celebrity is... Her dog bed and dog toys went for $351. Yep, celebrity trash picking. It's a surefire way of making a little bit of cash. Even if it is just a load of rubbish. All proceeds of the sale went to charities nominated by the celebrities whose privacy we invaded. Our little way of saying, please, don't press charges. Meet the Australian fridge. Bursting with food, but how much of it do we actually eat? Less than you might think. Australians throw out 4.45 million tonnes of food every year. 936 kilograms for every household. All up, that's about a quarter of the food we buy. The equivalent of $5.2 billion. More than we spend on the army. And that's only the tip of the food burg. We also waste the food it takes to grow the food. Consider what goes into a steak. 40% of all the wheat, rice and corn humans grow is used to feed animals. In developed countries, every kilo of beef requires about 10 kilos of cereals and up to 100,000 litres of water. Our squeamishness makes us even bigger wasters. Most Australians are only willing to eat certain parts of the animals we slaughter. 46% of the edible cow carcass is sold off cheaply for pet food and other uses. What does go to the supermarket shelf can also be wasted. 7% will be thrown away by the store, unsold or damaged, and 30% will be discarded in our homes, uncooked or left over. Vegetables aren't free from cost either. Every kilo of potatoes takes 500 litres of water to produce. Throwing out a kilo of white rice wastes 1,550 litres. Oh, and it costs 140 litres of water to make a cup of coffee. And then there's the beauty test. It's estimated that 20 to 40% of all fruit and vegetables are rejected by supermarkets because they don't meet visual standards. In Queensland, 100,000 tonnes of bananas, about a third of the annual crop, are thrown out each year because they aren't pretty enough or because they've fallen from a tree and touched the ground. And according to the CSIRO, 54% of Australian mangoes, more than half of the fruit produced, is thrown away. If you add up the food Australia wastes each year, it's enough to fill 720,000 garbage trucks. Placed end to end, the convoy would bridge the gap between Australia and New Zealand. Four times. To put that in perspective, just a quarter of the food wasted in the first world could feed all the people starving in the third world. Your fridge. Just another rest stop on the wasteful journey from farmyard to rubbish tip. Normal space bags can take up to six weeks to arrive, but due to a bending of the space-time continuum, by the time you order Stephen Hawking's quantum space bag, you'll have already received it. Call today and we'll throw in the Stephen Hawking top-down cosmology glove box paradox absolutely free. Other space bags are just waste of space bags. So order your quantum space bag today and don't just store your clothes, change their density matrix. In August this year, the High Court of Australia will hear a case brought by a Toowoomba parent challenging the National School's chaplaincy program on the grounds that it breaches the separation of church and state. But religion aside, education and mental health experts are strongly opposed to the scheme. They see it as a wasted opportunity, while the federal government and church groups insist it's cost-effective pastoral care. Kirsten Drysdale explores both sides of the story. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm announcing uh, today that the Commonwealth will fund a school chaplaincy program. A non-compulsory scheme, originally budgeted at $90 million over three years, the stated aim of the National School Chaplaincy Program was to help schools with pastoral care, spiritual guidance and support. I am calling them chaplains because that has a particular connotation in our language. Teachers' groups and the education union were furious that the government would fund well-meaning but non-qualified people rather than address the chronic shortage of expert psychological help to deal with the serious issues faced by young people at school. There are a number of reports that show that school chaplains are engaging in duties 
um, for which they're not qualified, such as counselling students with depression, anxiety, eating disorders or suicidal ideation. In spite of the opposition, both the Howard and Rudd governments expanded the program. School chaplains are making a difference. That is why today I can confirm that the government will be continuing the school chaplaincy program. And during last year's election campaign, Julia Gillard preempted a review of the scheme when she more than doubled the funding. Uh, look, I am very positive towards the continuation of this program. Bringing it to a total of almost $440 million. Who do you think the government is trying to please with this program? Clearly the religious lobby. It, it's mind-boggling, if you, if you like, that having announced a review of this program without having waited for the outcome of the review, during the course of the federal election, the Prime Minister announced its extension. Education Minister Peter Garrett says the timing was just a coincidence. Uh, entirely, as far as I'm concerned, I think that it's very clear that this has been a really popular program. And it was clear before the review was completed? Well, uh, absolutely. Today, there are federally funded chaplains in 2,700 schools across Australia. 98.5% of those chaplains are Christian, largely from evangelical churches. If it's not about religion, why is it a chaplaincy program? Chaplains are considered to be people who have a skills base that is well suited to providing pastoral care. So non-religious people aren't able to provide pastoral care? Of course non-religious people can provide pastoral care and schools are are in a position of having a range of services that they can draw from. The feedback that we get from principals is that this program is one which they welcome. It is a program where there's significant demand for the services that chaplains are providing. Uh, and on that basis, we're really excited about the possibility for its expansion. If schools could direct that money into needed resources, it would definitely be for more school psychologists, counsellors and social workers. Let me make it very clear, teachers and principals are telling us that what they need is resources to meet the needs of children. But we have caseloads that are just unmanageable. In New South Wales, for example, the caseload for a school counsellor could be anywhere up to 1,500 students for one school counsellor. Students that experience mental health problems um, are not accessing services from professionally qualified uh, mental health workers. Chaplaincy advocates, such as Tim Mander, CEO of Scripture Union Queensland, the nation's largest provider of school chaplains, says the two services should not be confused, insisting chaplains are not counsellors. You won't have a chaplain dealing with complex issues on an ongoing basis. They start to self-harm. The to... harrowing tales told by chaplains in Scripture Union's own promotional videos suggest otherwise. And she came up to me and she said, Shane, why doesn't my dad love me? A ten-year-old girl hung herself. Physical, emotional and sexual abuse scars run so deep that, in his words, he says, counsellors and therapists can't help me. They are there to be a listening point, um, a trusted adult for, as I said, in the, f in the first instance, a child to speak to. Just about anyone can get, you know, a child or young person to open up. It's actually what you do with that information when they do open up and that's what distinguishes someone that's qualified and someone that's not qualified. We believe there should be more psychologists in school. Um, uh, we want as much um, care for our kids as possible, but we don't think it should be at the detriment of school chaplaincy. Meanwhile, the government is working through the thousands of submissions to its recent discussion paper on how to expand and extend the program. The guidelines might be updated, but it looks like the program itself is here to stay. You can't get better evidence than the fact that more and more schools want this program, and that's what's happening. Any offer of funding for extra support is going to be well received. However, what we really need to be asking is, is this the best way to be using such a lot of money? Allocating monies in the order of $440 million is a wasted opportunity. Those monies should be targeted to allow us to enhance our professional services in schools, professional services offered by trained school counsellors and psychologists. That's where the money should be allocated.
Ice cool water delivered fresh from the heavens to a mountain, to a dam, to a pipe, to a factory, to a tap, to a bottle. Machine molded from melted polyethylene that began as refreshing pellets. Pellets. Elastic pellets. Shipped to a factory by the power of delicious diesels. Diesels. From the refinery where the pellets Pellets. were born. By the cataclysmic superheating of ethane and propane. Propane. Delivered and refined from the thirst quenching crude oil. Shipped by ships and machine pumped with pumps from the belly of the earth where it sat for billions of years. Just waiting. Waiting, waiting for, for you. you. Chilled by burning coal for when your thirst makes you thirsty enough to crack a fresh one open, suck it dry, and leave the container empty and barren. Some again will turn into bottles. bottles. Most, however, will fill up the land for millennia to come. Or they will tumble into the ocean where they will break apart into tiny pieces before being eaten by animals that are caught by men who will give them to other men who will give them to you when you're hungry enough to eat them and then you'll be thirsty again. Delicious, natural, bottled water. Water. Waste doesn't have to be a negative. Seen from the right angle, what we don't want anymore can be a valuable resource. Other countries are proving it as they cross the final frontier and recycle human waste. Australians flush away about 10 million kilos of crap every day. In other countries, however, human waste isn't so quickly wasted. Here's a crash course in global economics. Let's start in China, in the village of Mianzhu, where 60% of households, that's 10,000 families, use poo to power their homes. Rather than flushing it away, the brown gold is kept in biogas digesters, where it ferments, (sighs) producing gas and electricity. The pilot program has proved so successful, the Chinese government plans to install 80 million biogas digesters across the country by 2020, taking shit from the masses and giving power back to them. Over in France, gas derived from human waste is running buses. In Sweden, it feeds trains. And in Rwanda, it even powers prisons. Five of the nation's biggest jails, which house more than 100,000 prisoners, have started harvesting the output of inmates to power the buildings that keep them captive. Genocidal mass murderers are now giving back to society one turd at a time. Meanwhile, in Italy, the number one source of drug info is fast becoming number twos. The Milan Institute for Pharmacological Research analyzes sewerage to determine national levels of drug abuse, testing for cocaine, meth, and pot. Research boss Ettore Zaccato says the results are more accurate than those of traditional surveys, stating that people lie, their sewerage doesn't. The concept has now been picked up in Switzerland, the UK, and the United States. And human waste is being used for more than just the war on drugs. In Southeast Asia, fences of sharpened sticks dipped in excreta are used to ward off intruders from opium poppy fields. In Colombia, revolutionary group ELN uses fecal matter in explosive devices to increase the chance of infecting their targets. And in Virginia, USA, scientists have managed to extract the smelliest part of the turd known as the scatol to create a non-toxic stink bomb to be used for crowd control. Only to be used when the shit hits the fan. Of course, if poo can be used to make us sick, it can also be used to help us get well. In the Netherlands, doctors are experimenting with poo transplants, taking dung filled with healthy bacteria and pumping it directly into the stomachs of people suffering from infections. The early results are more than promising, and experiments are now also being done to see if the turd-based treatments can help those suffering from Parkinson's, obesity, and diabetes. Just to be clear, there is some squeamishness involved in having somebody else's arse eggs inside you. So doctors are now also working on poo grown in laboratories. Stunt double shit. So, the next time your finger hovers over the flush button, remember how valuable your waste really is. It could give us power, it could give us information, it could be used as a weapon, and even as a cure. Any way you look at it, shit is leaving its mark. All around the globe. ask you a couple of questions. And if, I, if I'm too stupid, you can cut it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you can waste money very easy. Alcohol. <laughs> I buy, you know, I buy lots of booze, drinking, smoking. One year I won a little bit of money and spent about 30 grand eating out for a year. 
30 kilos, 30 grand. <laughs> Sometimes I have a cup of coffee that is really bitter and burnt and I can't finish it. And I see that as a waste of money in today's age is when a coffee costs nearly as much as a glass of bubbly. My kids would say to me, could you actually cook? Could you stop ordering in food? The claw machines? I was bad on them. The what? The claw machines where you win the toys. I bought a surfboard once. Yeah. I bought a surfboard. I actually I live um, out at Cobar. How much money do you reckon you spend on a claw machine? In one day, probably about 250 That's 12 hours west. Yeah, right out in the country, so there's no water out there, so there's no need, no need for surfboard, is there? I spend far too much money on very expensive creams that are supposed to make me look lost <laughs> so much younger. And so far they haven't worked, but I still keep buying them. So I don't think I waste money because I think money is there to be earned and to enjoy and spend as you please, whatever brings a smile to your face or somebody else's. I went to uh, a pub and uh, put 100, $150, $160 for the pokies. Investments, <laughs> especially at, in 87. <laughs> that wasn't too wonderful. When you go and spend that $200 on that one little bit of enjoyment for half an hour and you know in your mind that you could have taken that your kids to a fun park or something for that whole weekend and you could have had a wonderful day and had smiles to remember for the rest of your life. Maybe my first marriage. <laughs> but I didn't really purchase that. <laughs> but it was a waste. That was a terrible waste. Follow. 75,000 US dollars, the price paid by an online casino for a kidney stone passed from William Shatner's urethra. Around $5 million, the value of a solid gold toilet owned by Hung Fung Jewelers in Hong Kong. $12 million, the amount paid to the traditional owners of Muckety Station in the Northern Territory to use their land as a nuclear waste dump. The first load, 26,500 litres of waste from Lucas Heights, is scheduled to arrive in 2015. Well, that's another episode of Hungry Beast Bagged and Binned. You can keep up with us during the week on our website or on Facebook or Twitter. Next week's Hungry Beast is dedicated to the download. You could watch it on television like my mum or download it like everyone else. <laughs> Good, Good night. night. Eye doses are completely legal, non-chemical, digital downloadable drugs. They come in the form of audio files. You plug in, press play, and apparently you should get the mother of all cum faces. There is a simple way to become anonymous online, a piece of software that is cheap and completely legal. It's called a VPN. Mind if we ask you a, a few questions? You sure? One in three Australians can't be wrong. She must be a MySpace user. Welcome okay? to the offline social network.